Yeah, we're live. Yes. Hey. Good evening, everybody. Happy Monday. This is Stefanetta Isis Harmon. I am the founder of Sadaya Black Beauty Guy, and you are tuned into Business of Black Beauty. Tonight, I have the amazing and comparable, like she is everything hair to me, um, Fatima Anthony. She's a celebrity hairstylist. She is a Naha Award winner. For people who don't know, that's North American Hairstyle Award, like North America, like the whole continent type situation. She's been on reality TV, like she's a genius. She works with the Who's Who's, and she is in Minneapolis and has her own salon called the Sweet Spot Salon Spa. And I have her here tonight to talk everything hair salon wise. Let's talk about. Wow, first of all, say hi, Miss Fatima. Can, can hey, <laughs> thank you for having me, Isis. Thank you for joining in and tuning in today for this conversation. I am just blessed and honored that you could be here today. I know you have a lot going on. Um, I do have a lot going on, but thank you for having me. Yes, yes. And those who don't know, she's based in Minneapolis in the Twin Cities, which has been ground zero of civil unrest post George Floyd. We're in the midst of a pandemic and she's still running a salon and still getting her life and keeping her life and finding her life every day. Every day. And so yeah, <laughs> every day, every day. Um, and I, I just wanted to connect with you and just find out where you are, what the salon life look like. And then also before we even get into that, you had us in tears, mama. You dropped Aww. a video post um, some looting, post some yes. destruction in the midst of uh, George Floyd, um, unrest and civil unrest. And we know it wasn't necessarily people that looked like us, but it was a lot of stuff happening up on your on your block. Can right. you tell us about that? Like, um, Well, you know, things got really crazy really fast. Um, I can remember that particular week, uh, I saw the video, the hours after he died early in the morning mm -hmm. and the next morning and from that day forward my life would change forever and so would this entire city so i remember being horrified at the way george died at the hands of the police and mm -hmm. um you know any person that is african-american that lives in america knows that these things happen on far too regular of a basis so we all wanted justice immediately and things started to, to aggressively uh, come to a boiling point until there was civil unrest. And uh, the city basically paid the price, so to speak, for um, all of this blood that's been shed, you know, in America. I, I will say that uh, when I did the video, it was completely organic and I was in the moment and I was feeling really devastated. I was, I was um, wanting you know, just peace in the community. I wanted justice for George and I wanted my dreams not to be shattered as a result of injustice. Uh, I will say that in that moment, I really didn't understand everything that was going on. And we had a lot of agitators in our city, people that flew in just to destroy the city that had nothing to do with um, wanting justice or equality or, you know, so I think a lot of it was misrepresented in the media. I do want to say that, but all in all, I'm still standing. Um, we could not open the salon immediately due to destruction in the area. So I decided that me and my team would pivot towards the community and do a food drive. And we fed over 500 people, 500 families, I should say. So we pivoted towards the community and did the food drive. And um, every week it's changing. I basically made a commitment to fill the needs of whatever the community needs until this time is over and um and the healing is done we have a lot of destruction wow so, so yeah it's gonna take years on. years years every day that i would get this this looting and and rioting and fires happen for over the course of three days and every day i would get up and just pray that my building was still standing and i would go and there was just smoke all around me it was like it, it's the damage is immeasurable. Actually, I I can't uh, put a dollar amount to it. I can't put an amount to the emotional value that was lost for me as an owner to see a lot of my business friends go out of business as a result. You know, still everyday businesses are closing because I was in an area where there was a lot of restaurants and they were already struggling. To all of us were struggling to try to stay open um, throughout the the time that we had been closed through COVID. So to 
right after that, be met with the uh, civil unrest was just unbelievable. So a lot of businesses did not make it. But Sweet Spot is still open. We are still serving the community and we are still serving our guests. And we're really excited about that. I feel really grateful. How long have you been at your location? I've been at that location for two years. And Mm -hmm. um, we plan on staying there another year and we'll be doing something really big to follow that. So excited about that. So there for two years, closed for a good four months. Five months? We were closed for four months solid. Four months. Mm-hmm. And, and then, then after, right when we get open. Yeah, we couldn't open immediately after the riots because of uh, the destruction in the neighborhood, because of mm-hmm. the graffiti. Um, I will. I do want to say thank you to the Hero Nerds, which is a media group that did start a GoFundMe for my business. So I will take this mm-hmm. opportunity to say thank you to them and thank you to every individual that donated to that. That is one of the very specific reasons why we are still standing. Wow. Yeah, so community is everything. Your tribe is everything. And you were out there on the block with the other owners along the along Lake Street, right? Really just helping to clean up together and, right. and really form a community, not just yeah. being on the block, but actually community amongst each other. You know, they say in the darkest times, people reveal who they really are, and I will say that um, in this time, I saw how beautiful our community really is and how diverse that is and how everyone just kind of came in together to just to to be whole again and we're still doing that so i feel like i'm surrounded by a lot of amazing um businesses in my area and a lot of them are salons and it's so interesting because you would think that we'd be competing but there's so much business and all of our businesses are so different that uh it's never felt like a competition so, um, yeah, it was really beautiful to see the community coming together, beautiful to see family. Uh, my clients that are from the suburbs drove in with their families to help with the food drive. I had over 30 volunteers and our drive took two days. It took us one day just to collect all the food, itemize it um, for, you know, for the needs of different families. And then the second day was just giving all day. And it took 30 volunteers every day. So uh-huh. that was pretty amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's a good feeling. So you're in this rebuilding phase. And on top of that, we're still in the midst of a global pandemic. I'm sorry. You said um, I could. You're in this rebuilding phase and we're still in the midst of a global pandemic. So yeah, is, it's man. Well, that's why is, we're having this interview on my patio or on my right? balcony because I have too many kids in my house. And uh, yeah, things are just really, really different. You know, um, we are working, we're back to work now and it's under different situations than we knew before. The world will look different. It is different. We're working with masks and gloves on um, Mm -hmm. all day, serving our guests. Uh, It's definitely different. And one of the things that we did for the salon experience, because we can't offer beverage services, um, we can't have more than one guest per uh, technician, we have elevated our experience for the guests. And I talked to the team about just really embracing them with an experience that is unforgettable because right now with everything being so stressful, people don't feel pretty. They don't feel loved. They're not being touched. And so we're in one of those rare industries where we still get to touch people. And I believe that there's energy and power in touch. And so um, I want our guests to feel really, really embraced in Mm -hmm. our care And so we've just elevated our treatments and uh, we are doing steaming treatments, shine treatments, and just pampering them with love and and, uh, attention. And it's so interesting. I had three clients last week say, this made my entire day. And that's really my goal, you know, just to make people feel like they're important. They're still loved. They're still beautiful. Um, I did a post on social media last week, like, who's still wearing lipstick? I only put lipstick on for this interview. I'm going to be honest. (laughs) Who's still wearing lipstick? Because if you're smart and you're wearing masks, you're not putting on lips. I don't want bacteria and stuff on my face. So um, I think it's important for us to really, for those of us in the service industry that are watching this interview, really, really understand the value of what we do. It's so much greater than someone going to see a doctor, right? Because they're Mm -hmm. uh, in, in physical pain. What we're doing is we're healing their heart. And we're making them feel beautiful and we're making them feel powerful. So I really want our guests to, to really feel that love when we touch them. So that's what we've been doing. Well, you know, we call we call our uh, our hairstylists, our, our pseudo psychologists, psychiatrists, yep. 
Yeah. We get some good hair therapy and some good life therapy. Yeah, and we have a therapist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A little Cute. bit of everything. So that that right. still must feel good that you're able, even though you don't get to see like how many like what is the reduction? How about how about that? Let's start there real quick. So I'll you're be saying honest, one I only, person. I, per? only, I do um three clients a day. I'll be really honest. I do have a high price point. Um mm -hmm. for me it's not high because I said it, but <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, so I average, you know, I won't say how much I make, but I do three clients a day and that's it. I okay. have decided to do that with 30 minute breaks in between each guest and I go outside. So we are fortunate enough to have a terrace like this where we can go outside and get fresh air. Mm -hmm. I have asthma. So number one, I do feel slightly compromised because of that. So I don't want to be in a mask for more than two hours at a time without a break. And I don't want to be in a mask all day just because of my breathing challenges with allergies right now. Okay. So I personally do three clients a day. I don't tell my team how many they can or cannot do, but uh, I'm, I make constant suggestions for them to take fresh air breaks and to drink a lot of water. Okay. So, well, you know, that's a blessing yeah. that you have mm -hmm. this environment that they're not stressed where they still feel like they have to get five or right. 10 people in and, no. and if they can make their booth or not make their, whatever that feels like or right. looks like. You know, that, it really that, should be quality over quantity at this point. Again, mm -hmm. like I said, we we understand that everyone in the world is going through so much emotionally, just being stuck inside or working remotely with their children. I mean, that the stress for all of us is so heightened. So I've really tried to encourage my team to be very tapped into their own self-care because we have to pour into our cups before we can give to others. So mm -hmm. I've really, you know, scarf and everything, I've really turned into a major kind of hippie of love and energy and clarity. I've never felt, you know, I says I've never felt more clear about my purpose, my destiny, and how I'm aligned to elevate people's experience on this planet. So I feel very blessed that I have the opportunity to do the job that I do and that I have the opportunity to impact people further than I can touch physically. So I feel very mm -hmm. grateful. Okay. Let's talk about that. You talk aligned yeah. with purpose. You um, have before texture was a conversation, mm -hmm. <laughs> you were, yeah. you've been talking about hair as a fabric for about what, 10, 15 years now, feels like 10 years. I was going to say, least. you know, I met you a long time ago and I remember <laughs> you joining me at a hair show and I was teaching a class for PBA uh, called Trending with Texture. And yes. thank you because uh, you've been writing for a long time for various uh, well-known magazines. And I remember you covering that class. And yes, I have been, uh, my mantra for hair since 2013 has been hair is a texture, it's not a race. And we are tailors mm -hmm. and every haircut and color should be tailor made. That was a mantra I created in 2013 and I have not changed it since then because I haven't felt that there's a conversation greater than that at this time. Mm -hmm. I would love to be able to elevate and change my message, but until people get that one, we're just going to keep talking about it. So okay. I'm working on something right now that uh, I'm pretty excited about that I can't talk about in great detail. But I realized that no matter how this conversation is had, people keep trying to segregate beauty. And um, it's unfortunate because all hair is texture. You know, all hair has texture. Uh, whether you are creating texture, whether you're removing texture, whether it's straight, whether it's curly, whether it's frizzy. So I'm creating a conversation that will be scientific and universal that is about hair um, that is so specific that people will not be able to segregate the language. Um, so that's coming and I can't talk, you know, in great detail again. I've been working on it for the past year. So I'll be glad when I can share that. I'll share Maybe I'll share it with you first. Please do. Yeah, and you, you know, be... every time you say you can't share something, you yeah. come back and you're like, yes, yeah, so now I'm part of the Interquartier. Yeah. Or now I'm part of this. Or we're like on a to... new TV show. So, you know. Yeah. I'm... <laughs> I like to work in silence and let all my success make the noise. That's what I like to do. Mm, okay. So we're talking um, hair being a fabric, not a race. And right. you also are very much into a beauty inclusion. I am. I'm on the... Um, Beauty Certified Board of Education here. And that is a board that does continued education for professionals. So if you're a licensed esthetician, cosmetologist, um, in any area, you have to 
get continued education to keep your licensure. So about a year ago, probably a little bit over a year ago, when I had to renew my license, I realized there was a lack of um, content or education for texture. And the problem with that is this conversation isn't had in beauty school. So if you don't learn it in beauty school, I feel that it should be had in the extended parts of your education. So I reached out to this board and said, hey, I really, first of all, they're top notch. I personally, I am biased. I'm on the board, but I thought, man, this team has really got it together. It's the best extended education that I've seen nationally. So I reached out to the president and said, hey, you know, I, you know, I see that you're kind of missing these gaps that can because, become a bridge for inclusion. And mm -hmm. he took me to lunch and asked about my ideas. I shared the classes that I've been teaching, as you know, for the past 13 years. And he said, you know, Fatima, not only do we want to onboard your classes, but we'd love to have you on the board because they recognized that it was a gap, but they didn't know how to fill the need. So they were super enthousi enthusiastic about bringing me onto the board. So that's been a really amazing experience um, because I had been writing letters to no avail to the boards of cosmetology, um, asking for more inclusion. I had, had been having meetings with Fortune 500s talking about inclusion. And um, so this was my way of having some sort of access to trying to change that conversation and to build that bridge. I think they say, or I don't know if they say, but I say that education is the great equalizer. Mm. That is gonna be the equalizer that um, brings us together and that joins us so that we're not disjointed and divided. I think that in any conversation where there's confusion, it's due to, it's usually a lack of, of information on one or both or, you know, some some one side someone doesn't have the information so if we can get people educated um then we can also have more inclusion ultimately awesome now you have been queen of pop-up when you talk about you've been talking <laughs> and writing letters to no yes yes and people will show up in a room like oh so y'all having something and we're not here How? yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> i actually i was going through my email because i was thinking about how all of a sudden it's a real big trend and you've known me a really long time. It's a real big trend now to call here a fabric. Well, it's been a fabric. We've been saying it's a fabric for, I made it, I coined it as a phrase it in 2013, but this has always been my conversation since I entered the beauty game. And so what's mm -hmm. interesting to me is I went through and I thought, how long have I been specifically having this conversation with corporations? And I'm going to name a few. Yes. I'm going to name Orbe. I'm going to name Aveda. I'm going to name Bumble and Bumble. I'm going to name all the companies that have treated me very well. I will, I will be very honest. And a maybe they company in there too. Um, L'Oreal. I sent letters <laughs> out to them saying, mm -hmm. Hey, you're lacking diversity in content information in um, imaging. And one specifically, everyone knows that I, I mm -hmm. actually, and this is no plug to them because I don't work for anyone. I work for myself. Um, I, I used Orbe editorially uh, for a lot of things. Orbe, L'Oreal, and Aveda, they've all been great to me. Um, but one of the things that I couldn't understand is why these products had high performance for every person, but they had limited conversation for their marketing. And um, when I had that conversation with Aveda, I was met with a job opportunity that they thought was amazing, which was, hey, you know what? We love working with you. We think you're awesome. How about you be our highly textured hair specialist? And, you know, that sounds like a great compliment maybe to some people. I personally thought that it was a marginalization of my skill set. I, I, mm. I wanted to, you know, I do all hair, so I didn't want to be put into this box. And I still felt pretty new in my career, even though I had won the awards and I had been on Bravo, I felt like the world hadn't really met me yet. And I didn't want to be um, put into a box of what people thought I could do. And so from that, um, all other companies kind of offered me the same type of opportunities. And I just branded my own thing. So I became an entrepreneur out of sheer desire to separate this image of how I'm supposed to be. So I could just kind of live the way I wanted to. And um, I won't lie, it was a real, I've had a really great career. I've been met with great challenges because when you're on a stage as a freelance entrepreneur and you have these multi-million dollar mega companies, you know, you get, I started to get pushed further and further into the back of the classrooms and further and further into the back of the program because no one really wanted to um, 
hear or see what I wanted to say, how I wanted to say it. So it was definitely a challenge and I had some great um, times of discouragement, but I knew that I was doing the right thing. And so I still feel really blessed in my career. I'm living a great life. I've had lots of success and I want to thank all of those companies. I'm not really trying to put them on blast, but what's really interesting is even still when all of this happened, I thought finally, right? Everyone, the world is listening. We're finally going to make some headway. But what I realize is companies aren't really trying to make real changes. They're trying to show performative solidarity. They want to put a Band-Aid on this so we can stop making all this noise. And what I want to say to these companies are, um, we're smarter than that. And we outspend our counterparts, meaning African-American women alone outspend our counterpoints. Every dollar they spend, we spend nine on beauty specifically. So not only are we not going to stop making noise, you cannot think that you're going to fix this with a couple of texture classes and a few SKUs. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for the aisle. We pay for the beauty aisle. So we don't want any more segregation in that aisle. We know our buying and our spending power. We know the power of our consumerism. And so it is time for you to take a real look at your company and look at who's navigating these conversations that are being held towards us. And if people that are having these conversations with the consumer don't look like the consumer, don't understand the consumer, then it's time to change the room. Because Mm -hmm. if you have been in this room creating the problem, then you can't fix the problem, right? And so my frustration right now is really about, wow, these companies really don't want to change the room. They want to have a a free conversation with me, pick my brain and go make a billion more dollars. And that's not, that's not how this works. So that's why I said I'm, I'm working on something where I've learned the limitation of corporate America, as far as the allowance of how many of us they will let in a room. And so because I have stopped trying to sit at the table long time ago, I built my own table. I'm creating content and information that is so valuable that people will have to make a reservation to sit at my table. I'm, I'm not trying to chase that. But for all of you that are in corporate America that are making changes, great. There's nothing wrong with sitting at the per- peripheral table, as we call it, if someone will make room for you to enter. I personally feel like I've been such a disruptor in beauty that people are afraid to let me in the room. But beauty, <laughs> need, <laughs> beauty needs disruption. Beauty needs disruption. We can no longer keep these status quo that make half of the segment of the population feel muted. That's not okay. Beauty is a space for everyone where everyone should be celebrated. Right. How has that changed? Because, you know, you you mentioned, you know, I was going to touch on the pull up or shut up and all these different things that we have with our with the memes that the brands are saying, hey, we do hire black. Hey, we want to put you on our in our timeline feed. How has it changed? Like, has how much progress have you really seen been made from 2013 till now? Actually, you've been doing this longer than 2013. <laughs> Say, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, now. I'm gonna be honest. I I see zero change in a way that is significant. Just mm. because you put brown people or Latina people on your feed or transgender people on your feed, it doesn't mean that you are really uh, supporting those communities and that you're really authentic with that voice. And so. Um, there was a, there is a class that I teach and it's called brand new brand you and mm-hmm. some free advice that I'm going to give to any company or any person that's listening right now to this interview. There are three things that are highly significant in brand success. Number one, authenticity. Number two, audaciousness and three adaptability. So a lot of these companies are lacking an authentic voice when they're speaking to us because they aren't speaking to us. They're speaking to the idea of who they think we are. They are lacking audaciousness because they want to wait until some other company does something or makes headway before they make a move because they want to see if that's successful. But if you are authentic and you're audacious enough, you're just going to do it because you believe in it. And then Mm -hmm. the adaptability piece is really about how fast and how hard we can pivot. And so I, I, I really, it, It's really, I don't, I want to sound positive because I'm a blind optimist. However, I see that companies aren't really bending or changing or pivoting to the space or the pace that we have padded their pockets. Right. I really want them to look at these numbers and really understand that we are your ultimate consumer. And so why there would ever be 
two spaces for beauty to exist in, a, in an aisle and one is just for Latina or African-American women when we are the number one consumer. Why is that? If there were any aisles separated, then we should be the main aisle. But no one's trying right. to speak to us in that way. And we are outspending in every kind of market there is when it comes to beauty, as you know. Right. And I know, I know you got all the numbers because we both like numbers. You know. I <laughs> <laughs> and so I, as, a, as a consultant, I like to deal with the facts, you know. So what mm -hmm. I cannot understand is how we are... Um, we are the ultimate consumer, but we are under service and we're, you know, it's just, it doesn't make any sense to me. We're under service, the least visible, the least represented, the least thought right. of, the least considered when they're producing pro uh, packaging right. and promoting. And, you know, there's a very specific uh, thing that I was thinking about last week about mm -hmm. what this mute does. And I keep saying to companies that I talk to, you know, beauty does three things. It makes, it gives people value. It makes mm -hmm. them feel seen and it makes them feel heard. Those three things together, value, being seen and heard equals making you, giving you power. And so by muting these voices or these faces and not sharing the space with us, they are silencing our power. But the really amazing thing about us as African-American women is that we have found this pulse and this swag and this rhythm on our own. And when you think about how an African woman comes into a room, she could have not a lick of hair, she could be bald. But the way we are so vibrant in the colors that we wear, in our makeup, in our, I mean, we just, we can't be ignored in a room. And so we found a way to still celebrate each other's beauty through our energy, through the colors we wear, through our magnificent creative hairstyles. I mean, I think we are, you know, I'm biased. I think we are some of the most beautiful creatures in the universe. And um, I don't know if that excellence is what makes people afraid. Is it too much? Do they feel like we're too much? You know, I used to always think that when I went in a boardroom, I knew that um, I was not being embraced by corporate America because I am very audacious. And I'm not, a, I'm not gonna apologize about feeling confident or smart or, and people can perceive that however they want. want. I won't um, make myself less than to make someone feel more than. So right. my voice has power. My insight and intellectual property will not be used for free. I know the value of me, which is why I created my own company. So I really hope these companies can get it together though, because we all need to work together. We do. And we they do. Need, if they want to keep the coins, they got to they got to connect with us. They got to connect right. with the consumer in order to keep right. our coins exactly. in 2020 and beyond. Yeah. Um, someone asked uh, Monet Everett. She's also a hairstylist um, who asked about um, ways that you've been disrupting because I I've seen you in action mm -hmm. <laughs> in terms of be, being a disruptor. For those who don't know, Fatima, first of all, is a celebrity hairstylist, reality TV star hairstylist like she was on Sheer Genius, Bravo Sheer Genius. Naha, which is North American Hairstyle Award. She's a winner of that. That's the elite. That's like the Oscars of hair, y'all. The Oscars. Right. She was dealing with texture way back before people were even wanting to talk about it. And there's something else. Award winning. Naha. You got a salon. I'm missing something. Oh, uh, you are in the know. Hall of Fame. Oh, I am in the Hall, Hall of Fame. You're on the Vegas Hall of Fame. Oh my God, I'm so excited. I forgot. How could I forget that? <laughs> pretty outstanding. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, she's um, in a Veda in the halls. If you walk in like Aveda's headquarters in Minneapolis and you you will see her on the wall. She not only brown face up there. Have they added yeah. a new one since you? Uh they I think they just put a new picture up there and I haven't oh, visited the school. <laughs> yeah. I haven't I haven't visited the school in a while, but I'm super excited about that. I okay. did forget she about that. Face. I um, feel very blessed. I feel very blessed that I've been able to achieve the things that I have done. Um, someone asked how I just, how I've been a disruptor. How you disrupt in the midst of all of that, when you walk in a space, how are you challenging and changing perceptions and how do you want to continue doing that? Well, number one, how I disrupt is I've never, um, not been a person that's just been honest. So I'm very transparent and I'm very vocal in how I feel about things. And I think that that's why I've not had a lot of success in a traditional way in beauty because mm -hmm. people felt like I was too noisy. I'm making too much noise about inclusion. I'm making too much noise about black being beautiful and black being enough. And, and, and I, um, you know, I wasn't intentionally trying to disrupt. 
I just knew that there needs to be more inclusion in that space. And I've made, I think the greatest ways that I've disrupted is to be very vocal and very honest about the virtual ceiling for women in the industry, in corporate America and all. So as you know, I'm very passionate outside of inclusion, that space is greater in my heart for women, for women to be elevated and celebrated in spaces that we have not been. So my salon, um, I built my mission and vision on three C's, and that was connect, collaborate, and cross-promote women, thereby elevating each other's platforms. So my salon has been very intentional about always trying to welcome in women who are girl bosses, who have significant roles in the community and connecting them together so that we can make changes in the community, in corporate America, make changes in our homes. And so I think that the greatest space that I've ever disrupted in is in the movement for women, because I am a single mom, I am an entrepreneur, and I am, I'm audacious, I'm loud, I'm, I'm confident. And I think that women are punished for that. I really do. I think that people don't want us to be so squeaky, you know, they want us to just mm-hmm. come in and look pretty and agree to things that maybe aren't okay. And um, I'm telling women to be authentically themselves in spaces and unapologetically strong and confident and honest. And I think that that's hard for a lot of women to do because we don't get a lot of room. So Fine. I just say, keep making the rooms, keep making the room for ourselves, keep pushing it, keep you know, and I guess it's easy for me to say, um, it hasn't been easy for me to do, but I decided that since people didn't give me the space, I created my own spaces and that's been a wonderful journey for me. So. Creating your own space Mm -hmm. um, and really pushing the envelope any chance you get. What, Right. now that you're working on something new that we can't wait to hear about, I'm tuning in, just trust, I'm gonna stalk you on this. Um, Okay. What does success look like for you and what impact or legacy do you want to leave behind with your work? Wow. So success looks like for me, um, living in my authentic truth and where my heart is led to lead change. That's what Mm -hmm. that looks like for me. And so I feel very successful right now and I have felt that way in a while. So that is, um, just being, honest and authentic and making sure that my truth speaks to elevating people's lives. And so that's what that looks like for me. Um, The legacy that I want to leave behind, gosh, is that what you asked me? Yeah, the legacy, the impact. What do you want us to remember you for? Yeah, I want to be remembered for creating a world that my daughter doesn't have to question whether the outfit she wears will uh, be distracting for a conversation that she wants to have in a boardroom. Or, you know, I want her to get up like every man gets up and puts on his socks, his shoes, his whatever, and not have to think twice about it. You know, I want her to um, feel appreciated in every room and in every space. So that is the legacy that I want to leave behind. I want to leave behind the legacy of boldness, um, Mm -hmm. And really, I just, everything I'm doing is trying to create a more inclusive space for women and people of color in the future. So I, I just pray in, in my lifetime that I see a different world than I've experienced. Mm-hmm. Um, and one thing that I wanted to share, if I don't know if we're closing out, but one of the things that I wanted to oh, share is, you know, there's been lots of conversation about privilege and, mm-hmm. um, and people are very offended or, or aghast when they find out, oh my God, I have white privilege. And and, you know, they, they either feel two ways. They feel offended or they feel guilty or, or they have lots of questions. And one of the things that I want to say is I do feel as an African-American person that has been highly educated, that grew up in a suburban home, I, I recognize that I've had privilege in my life. Very few people have seen the kind of success that I've seen um, and that still came with measured availability and access and resource for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I want to say that For those that are struggling with, oh, my God, I have privilege or um, you know that you are a person that is a gatekeeper that is um, holding policies and and places and things in in a space that create an oppressive world. It's time for us to understand that privilege doesn't mean that you should necessarily feel guilty. It means that you should feel responsible for elevating people that are where you are. And so with my privilege has come responsibility. And that is to try to elevate as many people that look like me, that sound like me, that that everybody deserves to have access 
And I think right now the greatest struggle in this fight for equality is access to resources, access to the same funds. I, I opened a business and I hate to say it, but a national bank did a commercial about me, but wouldn't give me a loan. And so because, <laughs> oh, mm -hmm. I did not know they didn't give you money. No. Oh, okay. And so I think that when people see that commercial, I was going to say their name, but I still might Don't work with them say again, we but I'm not going to say it. Okay. Yeah. A national, a, a bank really loved my uh, mission and what I had been doing and they wanted to celebrate that and they created a commercial and I thought, this is amazing, but I wish they would have gave me money to open my business, you know? So I think that um, it's really interesting that, that we don't have the same opportunity based on limited access. So um, if you are a person that is a gatekeeper, or you're, if you're a person that is a decision maker in beauty or media, it's really time to give people access and to not just share our stories of trials and tribulations, but to, sh to share our triumphs. Also, I think a lot of this is, again, like I said, education is a great equalizer. When people see African-Americans, we don't want them to just know our pain. We want them to know our power also and our excellence. There's so many stories that have not been shared about us. And I think by sharing those stories, people can change their perceptions of who they think we are and they will lose that fear of who they believe we are because we are mm -hmm. magnificently and wonderfully made. And um, that's it. I, I don't know. I don't know what else to say. So well, you, you just talked about access and, and us yeah. celebrating our power and not just highlighting our pain. What advice would you have for um, salon owners, aspiring entrepreneurs, everybody in this black beauty space right now that is really still trying to get that foothold, that, that, right. that grasp into their, their career and their, their business. You know, I think it's really time for us to really start speaking specifically to our consumer, which is us. And I want to encourage us to spend money with us. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the first piece. You know, we say that, but if we really consumed at the power that we're consuming in the world with uh, black businesses and black owned businesses, we wouldn't have all this lag. So, you know, right. for every person that says we deserve this, you go spend that dollar, you know, we're not turning our dollars around in our own community. So I'm gonna say to those brands and um, business owners to speak directly to our community and challenge them to put their money where their mouth is. Hey, I'm That's in your city. That's a lot of money. That is a lot That's of a lot of money. 1.3 trillion black buying power. Absolutely. Upwards of 500 billion. It's upwards of 500 billion as a beauty. If you consider yeah. grooming, weaves, extensions, I have to tell you, hair tool. Being in Minneapolis, 80% uh, of my clientele is other, uh, <laughs> meaning non-black. And mm -hmm. after COVID, um, I was excited to go back. And I, I, again, I have a very high price point. I would say that uh, after the riots, a lot of my clients were very uncomfortable coming back into the city. And I don't know if they didn't want to have oh, conversations wow. about race or whatever. I don't know. I can only speculate. But what I do know is the 30 percent that stayed and they're not just black, but those right. clients have held me down. I have not felt a gap in my income because these clients have made sure that they are supporting my business and, and elevating it. Um, so. Thank God for that. You know, so I think that we have to roll hard for these businesses that we know are minority owned, women owned, uh, locally made, family owned. It's very important that we turn our dollars around and spend it back in our own community. You know, before you run a Target, is there a small boutique or store that you can go support that um, has the same goods? I mean, no offense to Target, but Target has enough money. So I would challenge um, the consumer Mm -hmm. to put the dollar back. I specifically, when I go eat out now, I only eat out at locally owned restaurants. If I don't know the oh. owner, I don't eat there. If they're a franchise, I don't eat there. Not right now. Not while I know that there's this pandemic and restaurants are closing every day. So I specifically try to eat at minority owned restaurants, locally owned restaurants or family owned restaurants uh, or mm -hmm. women supported businesses or women owned businesses. So I think it's very important for us to put our money where our mouth is. That's beautiful. We have to put the power back in our dollar. Right. We talk we about do. like buying power, but we're not owning that power all the way. Correct. That's awesome. That's what the Sadai Black Beauty Guide is. It's to, to direct you to black owned businesses. Yes. So and I appreciate that. Yes. Ah, I have two more questions for you. I know I've got a lot of your 
take a lot of your time. So thank you so no, much. This is good. Um, it's great. Thank you. We have another comment here um, from Monet Everett who asks, what direct requests should be made when we're when you want to reach out to general market brands. So you're in a room and they called you. What's that? What should they be asking for? What should, if so, Monet is asking if she's called into what, a corporate space, what should she be asking for? A corporate space, a general market space. Like what the should she be asking thing, for? The first thing that I want to say is that I don't think that we get enough um, value for our intellectual property. So one of the, the things that I did when Aveda called and wanted me to do some things, some work with them. I made sure that Aveda, I don't know if they'd ever done it before. I've never asked, but I know that people have made comments about it. Whenever I did a collection for Aveda, it would say Fatima for Aveda. I always wanted my name to show first. And that seems like a very small feat, but when I look at it, that's a very big feat to, for a company to say yes. I mean, if they're calling you, know your power. And so what if you ask and they say no, you can just ask. And Aveda never said no. They were like, oh, okay. So I was like, yeah, when I see this campaign, I want to see Fatima for Aveda. And they honored that. And I think that's beautiful. And I remember one of their artists saying, you know, I'm kind of jealous that you're outside of our network and they put your name on stuff because there was someone on their team that would never see her name in like the forward oh. credits. And mm -hmm. so... I would say that would be the first thing is to make sure that you're getting um, accolades for your intellectual property or your creative power and making sure that you get compensated enough. Those are always the two things, my two big asks when I go in a room. Ask for that money. Don't and be afraid. To, at, do not look. be afraid to ask for your money. No, <laughs> not at all. So. Okay. That's real talk because we 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 are sometimes, especially as women, not just being black, but also yeah. as women, we don't always ask for the amount. It took we me don't a demand few years. the amount that we should get. Yeah. yeah, it took me a few years. I mean, many companies just wanted to give me shampoo and this and that, and I realized, man, if they're not paying me, I'm not going to put their name on something. I'm not going to tag you in something if I'm not being paid to endorse that. Athletes get paid all the time to endorse. So I remember a major company, a major color company, saying, "Hey, we're going to send you this, and all we want is our name." every time you publish something. And I thought, no, I want a check for that. You're not going to pay me in shampoo. Shampoo doesn't pay my light bill. So Monet, get your money, girl. Get your Monet, get your Monet. Get your Monet. That's what I got to say. So be about that coin. And that's okay. I think that we act so, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean you're not humble because you want to be paid. You know, your creative intellect is current. It's your currency. So I think that we're too humble about asking for our money. And that's definitely a way that I've been a disruptor for sure. I've never been um, afraid to ask for the money that I want to make. And I have to say, I've been told more, m no more than I've been told yes, but that's okay. That is okay. I found other ways to make my money. Okay. So. All right. Thank you, Mona. I that's a great question. Yeah. And how do you know yeah. how much to ask for? Let's, cause you, or you just threw a number out there like, look, I heard someone no. else got paid this. You no, you don't throw, like, you, you know, you have to do your market analysis and your market research. Okay. So, you know, yeah. So you can't just throw numbers out there. You want to make sure that you're compensated appropriately uh, on a level that scales to what the market will bear. And so I think a lot of ways that you can do that is great mentorship. So I have people mm -hmm. that, that do what I do on different levels. And so I can kind of converse with them on, you know, what would you ask for this? I mean, yeah, you definitely have to do your market analysis. So you can't just throw numbers okay. out there. Awesome. Yeah. Well, one last question on my mm -hmm. end. You know, the show is about the business of black beauty. Yes, it is. And every, you know, everybody trying to be in this business. What's the biggest lesson that you've learned? Or what's the one thing you wish you had known? Pick one. The biggest lesson or the one thing you wish you had known beforehand? You know, the one thing that I wish that I had known earlier okay. is that. Um, I tried to suppress being different for so long. I grew up feeling different and I grew up, um, see the space. Yeah. I, I grew up thinking that I needed to conform to what was perceived as normal. But one of the things that I've learned is that by being different, I'm able to make the difference. If I thought like everyone else, and if I moved around like everyone else, then I'd just be like everyone else. And because I don't think, the same way and I perform differently and I dream differently and I um, just imagine differently. That is the space that creates 
new in the world. That is the space that creates innovation and influence. And so I didn't do any of that for fame. I just, once I tapped into who I really was and was like, I'm going to allow God to move through me in this way, that was when I really tapped into my greatness. That was when I really realized this is the energy that I've been suppressing. It's like my superpower. It's like I mm-hmm. had all this power inside of me and I was suppressing it. So the one thing that I wish I would have done differently is to tap into embracing my difference earlier. I didn't want to make people feel uncomfortable. I didn't want them to, I didn't want to be so strong and so black and so loud and so creative. And now I'm like, I love it. If you don't feel comfortable, you leave the room. I'm not going nowhere. So that's where I'm at now. And I'm sure that a lot of people, as soon as I sit down, probably get up and leave. And that's fine. Cause I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable in my skin. And that's a great question. Thank you so much. I don't think that everyone, anyone's ever asked me that particular question. Um, oh, wow. I always get, that's I do get cool. nervous about interviews, even though I do a ton of them, I get nervous. So really? That, yeah, I do. I still do. <laughs> so hopefully just because, you know, it's like you're putting something out in the universe forever. This is an mm. imprint and this is going to Even when we hang up and we're off and we're not live anymore, there's an echo that is created and a pulse. And it will either move people, that vibration will get louder or stronger. And so I want to make sure that uh, the things that I say have impact, purpose, and power so that we can all kind of really tap into our our frequency and make a louder impact and amplify love, amplify equality, amplify beauty. You know, that's important to me. So I want to... I'm always trying to be so careful because I'm kind of freestyle. I say whatever I think, but I know that it has impact. So. Yes. Well, no, this conversation is going to echo. Like, this is beautiful. It's going to echo harmoniously. Thank you so much for the jewels that Thank you drop, you. the inspiration. Um, if there's anything else that you want to share with our audience right now, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm telling everyone to follow, find, um, fangirl. Her sweet spot Aww, salon spot. Thank you. Yeah, the um, only thing I wanted can, to say is I really want to celebrate mm-hmm. you because I've known you a really long time. And before this was a trend, we've been moving around, moving these waters, and creating this echo for a long time, you and I. And I really appreciate Aww, your authenticity. You. I really appreciate um you tapped into your greatness long before I did. And so I, number one, I think you're a very creative and talented force. I want to thank you for having me. I was super excited to talk to you because I know that you are true to this space and you always have been. I remember when you started Mm -hmm. this baby and you said, this is my dream for my baby. I want to amplify black uh, voices and stories and brands. And, and I remember you um, interviewing me and I think it was for hype hair and you came to the beauty show and you and I made, well, we already knew the observation that all of these black brands, the very few that were there were jammed in the back of the, the show floor. Way and back. you and I had a really long conversation about how that needs to change. And here we are now, how many years later? Wow. 15 years later, having the same conversation. And so this is not a new conversation. There are new voices joining into this conversation, but you and I have been on a path of inclusion for a really long time. And so yeah. I appreciate and celebrate you in this space. And I think this is beautiful what you're doing. So I really am humbled that you would even um, talk to me because- oh, Look, um, I'm humbled you're here. Yes. Oh. So <laughs> I celebrate you and thank you for having me in this beautiful space. And thank you for amplifying our voices. And thank you for sharing our stories of triumph and not you know, just our troubles and trials. So yes. hopefully you know, what we discussed today will give people that power that they are. It will, it will actually unlock the power they already have. We all have the power to change the world. We, we absolutely do. We're just trying to give people the keys, the nuggets, the information to unlock the door so that we can mm-hmm. really just let it all fall out and let the world know how amazingly excellent we are. That's so thank you. Well, thank you. Okay. Oh, look, I can't be crying up on here. So Uh-oh. look, everybody, trying, thank you. I don't you trust my t- cop. I feel a little tickle. I'm like, <laughs> Coke, is that you? <laughs> No, it's is not. that wait? No, we don't want. No, no, uh, no, no, we don't no. got that. We're good. No, but I, I'm but really honest you. in that compliment to yes. you. So. Oh, that that means so much. You don't even know that means so much because oh, you don't good. be talking to nobody. You know. Nope. 
Well, one thing about me is I don't give false compliments. Ooh, wee. I'll tell you if something's crooked. That's not lined up. I don't like that. That color isn't right on you. I will tell the truth. You know that. So one of the yes. things I always say is if I give you a compliment, know that I that it's a compliment. I don't give fake compliments. Mm. Wow. So. so thank you so much. I'm humbled. Um, I hope you all have enjoyed this conversation with Fatima, Fatima Ampi. Um, she is owner, founder of Sweet, Sweet Spots Lawn Spa. Mm -hmm. She's a celebrity hairstylist. She's a whole bunch of awards and accolades and things attached to the back of her name. Follow her at FatimaInc.com as well. F-A-A-T-E-M-A-H-I-N-C. Um, and Thank then you. go to her website, check out her work. It's amazing. It's groundbreaking. It was moving stuff before we even knew how to celebrate black hairstylists. Yeah. So, you know, you've been in spaces. So if you have not yeah. heard of her, please check her out. And again, you know, I'm thankful that you all tuned in. If you have any other questions, drop them. We will connect them to her. If you want to link with her, you know, this is connections. We are yes. celebrating and creating platforms. And, and feel free if one. you are an artist or a business owner and you want to, you know, I am a consultant by trade and I, um, I really believe in mentorship. And so if you um, have questions, you can definitely feel free to DM me. I, I won't promise I'll get back immediately because life is very busy right now. We're rebuilding it's our busy, community. But yeah, but I, I mean, <laughs> I always want to make myself available. So hit me up, yes. follow me, do all those things and let's support each other. Let's love each other and let's elevate each other. Yeah. So awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Business of Black Beauty. Thank you. Thank you.